And this series is about experiencing in all its fullness the life, the life that Jesus won for us. That's what we're talking about, life in the spirit. And the good news is we don't actually have to try and figure out and muddle through our lives on our own. How good is that? We don't have to try and work it all out. We don't have to try and have it all together. We don't have to try and come up with every single plan and thought and because we fall far short of what God's plans and thoughts are. But it's good to know we don't have to. We don't have to try and muddle it all out on our own. And so this morning, I want us to think for a moment about sheep. So profound. Thank you, Cass. <laughs> I want us to think about sheep. Yes, sheep. Sheep are notorious creatures of habit. If left to themselves, they will follow the same trails until they become ruts. They'll graze the same hills until they turn to desert wastes. They'll pollute their own ground until it's corrupt with disease and parasites. Sheep, you might have thought, just take care of themselves, but not so. They actually require meticulous care more than any other livestock and endless attention. And the strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it's almost impossible for them to lie down and rest unless four things happen. They need to be free of all fear. They need to be free from friction with other sheep. They need to be free from tormenting flies or parasites. And they need to be free from hunger. So for sheep to be at rest, to lie down and be at rest and not be flighty and want to run or looking around, they, there must be a definite sense of freedom from fear, tension, irritations and hunger. Why am I talking about sheep? <laughs> you might be thinking that. It's okay. Because one of the pictures that's repeatedly given to us in the Bible is one of a shepherd and a sheep. Shepherd and sheep. The way of a shepherd with his sheep. So we read in Matthew 9, verses 35 to 36 in the message paraphrase, it says, Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus saw the crowds, and I believe he saw every individual in the crowd, and I believe he sees every individual in this crowd, in this room. He sees you. And his heart was torn and it wrecked him that people who thought... They knew what was best or they thought they were living a way of life that seemed right to them. Well, it was all they actually knew, but they thought they were doing all right. But it was so evident to Jesus that it was a dead-end kind of life. They were harassed by disease and sickness. They were helpless to manage themselves. They were crippled by fear and restless for adventure and purpose and meaning. There's got to be more to this life. And maybe you resonate or relate to one of those things. Worst of all, they were left to struggle along and make the best of a hopeless future without someone to be their champion. And Jesus so longed to be their champion, <laughs> to come alongside and to meet the needs that they were facing, to come alongside and with tenderness whisper into their ear that he knows them and he's got all things under control, not to fear and not to worry. And he so wanted them to know that there was a greater purpose and plan for their life. And he couldn't stand it that each face in those crowds was like a sheep without a shepherd. Because he so longed to be their shepherd. <laughs> he so wanted them to know that he was that someone they were looking for. Maybe they didn't even know they were looking for. He was that someone they were made for. And he so wanted them to put 
their lives into his care. He knew it was why it come. In John 10:10 10, 10 to 11, it says this, just the first part of verse 11, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And this might be your first or your first few times at church and you've been thinking, I'm not sure what I think about God and Jesus. I'm not sure about all this sort of stuff. And I would encourage you, if that's you, to keep coming back, to keep asking questions, to have an open heart and just to say, well, God, if you're real, show me. Because many people believe the lie that to acknowledge God's ownership of their life is to come under the rule of a tyrant or to somehow have their freedom curtailed, their wings clipped, <laughs> have their freedom stolen. But Jesus said it's actually not him that's the thief. The thief is the devil, the enemy of our souls, the one who tries to master and push down and contain and destroy people. But Jesus, God in human form, tells us straight. He says, I am the good shepherd. And Jesus offers us full and overflowing life here on this earth. And he says, you know what? I've gone ahead and I've prepared a place for you so that you can be with me where I am forever in eternity. He says, if you will make me the master, the manager, the boss of your life, just you wait and see the good that I will do. Just you wait and see. (laughs) Both in you and through you. I'll do more than take care of your every need. I'll make it so that you flourish and thrive even in the midst of hard situations. My transforming power can help you break free of things that have held you back so that you can be all that I've created you to be. I've prepared a place for you with me in heaven. So Jesus, the good shepherd, tells us straight. But he also didn't just say it, he proved it. (laughs) Because the next little part of that verse, in verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It costs Jesus his life to win you back, to set you free from the enemy's hold on your life. It costs Jesus his life, which he willingly laid down, which he, he went through the cruelest of torture and he, it wasn't for his sins, it was for ours. He took the punishment. He took them on his body. He willingly proved and demonstrated that he is the good shepherd and he'll do whatever it takes to ensure the well-being of the sheep. He'll do whatever it takes to ensure that the sheep knows that they have a heavenly Father who they can have access to forever, who they can love and trust in. And it was his love that kept him on that cross. And I wonder if he had fleeting moments of thought or little lies going, it's not worth it. But he was like, yes, it is. Because I love them and I want to be their shepherd. I'll give my life for them to prove how much I love them. And after he died and was buried, his resurrection power raised him from the dead. He is the good shepherd and he's here. We've already, many of us, sensed his presence here today. And he wants desperately to be your shepherd. The question is, is he your shepherd? Have, have you come under his leadership of your life? Are you still trying to run it yourself? Or maybe, like all of us, our hearts sometimes wander and coming to church or coming back as we read the scriptures, we're like, yes, Jesus, you are my shepherd. I come back. <laughs> And I affirm again that you are my shepherd. What I want us to do right now is actually pray and ask Jesus to either be our shepherd for the first time. He extends the invitation. He says, I want to be your shepherd. I lay down my life for you. Or if you have received him, 
to realign your heart to say, yes, again today, Jesus, you are my shepherd. You are the one who leads my life. Can we pray and do that? Jesus, right now is a a really holy moment because we bring our hearts to you and you're the one who sees our hearts and understands our motives. And right now, if there's anyone in this place who has never said, Jesus, you are my shepherd. You can just say this in your heart. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me. For all the wrong things I've ever done, I didn't realise that you took the punishment for those things and I'm so grateful. I thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place, for laying down your life for me. I receive you now. Come into my life by your Holy Spirit so that I can live for you and follow you and have you helping me to be all that you've made me to be. Thank you that I now can spend eternity in heaven with you based on what you've done, based on your free gift. I thank you that I'm now a child of God. In Jesus' name. And for all of us here who have at one time or another said, yes, Jesus, you're my shepherd, today we reaffirm Maybe he's just speaking to you about an area in your life where you've said, no, I'll do it my own way, thanks. Or you're relying on your own strength. Or you're unwilling to let go of unforgiveness. And you're holding on to bitterness. And he's asking you to come and bring it back and put it into his hands and leave it at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, you're the leader of my life. You're my shepherd. Or maybe you have anxiety or there's issues with your marriage or your relationships and you're just going over it and over it and over it and you can't let it go. But today God's just saying, just, I know, give it to me because I'm your shepherd. Father, we do surrender afresh to you. We thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd. We can trust our lives into his care. Amen. That's not the end of the sermon. (laughs) We usually give opportunity for that at the end of the message, but I just really felt right up front that we needed to do that today. Um, So if you did pray that prayer for the first time, you are now God's child. He has come to live in you by his Holy Spirit. And it's just so wonderful uh, that you stepped out and actually invited him in. Because each one of us is invited to come under his leadership today. (laughs) Because he wants to empower us to live the life he's won for us. Life in the Spirit means experiencing in all its fullness the life that Jesus won for us. Life in the Spirit means being empowered by the Spirit. So how does the Holy Spirit actually do that empowering? Well, the first thing is that I want us to focus on today is that the Holy Spirit is an endless supply. Pastor Bill told us in week one that the Holy Spirit is just like who? Jesus. It's just like Jesus. He's limitless in power and endless in supply. He never runs out and he never runs dry. Some of you are just going to have that running around in your head this week. Praise the Lord. Put it to music with your kids if you've got kids. <laughs> we run out of resources and we get to the end of ourselves. We get dry and try and do things in our own strength, but he never does. Do you believe that? His resurrection power is limitless. Nothing is impossible for him. And he's always at work to reveal Jesus and to help Jesus' followers to do God's will. So when we give our lives to Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit in us. In Romans 8 it says, You are no longer ruled by your desires, but by God's Spirit who lives in you. People who don't have the Spirit of Christ in them don't belong to him. 
We are now fully acceptable to God as his child if we've asked Jesus to come into our life. We don't need to do anything or add anything or have any other experience to make us a Christian because now our bodies are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And so when we become followers of Jesus, we have his transforming power at work in us. And he is an endless supply. The Apostle Paul talked about in Colossians 1, he said, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. That man just kept getting up. You think about what he went through. He was beaten, he was tortured, he was shipwrecked, he was imprisoned, he was lied against. I just could go on and on and on. And he just kept getting up. What kept him getting up? The power of the Holy Spirit that lived within him. So if you've received Jesus into your life, he lives in you. As a believer in Christ, don't let anyone ever tell you you're not a Christian if you've not yet been baptised in the Holy Spirit with that evidence of speaking in tongues because it's not true. (laughs) It goes against what the Bible teaches about salvation being by grace, which is a free gift, through faith, trusting in Jesus alone. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Jesus has set you apart for himself and you now belong to him forever. Praise the Lord. But once the Holy Spirit is in us, God wants him to come upon us and keep coming upon us so we can be more effective witnesses for Christ. So he is an endless supply, but he also empowers us to be Jesus' witnesses. You think about the before and after shots of Simon Peter, (laughs) a disciple of Jesus. Before, he was running away from the Garden of Gethsemane and denying Christ. After, in Acts 2, after being baptised in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, Peter, an ordinary fisherman, gave his first ever sermon. He just pops up (laughs) and starts preaching. And Peter explained what was happening by quoting the prophet Joel. He said in Acts 2, In the last days God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And then Peter goes on to say, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. And after his message, 3,000 people believed on Jesus and were baptised. <laughs> that was the birth of the church. So before Peter, this weak, scaredy cat, which I relate to, very impulsive, speaking the wrong thing at the wrong time, which I relate to. <laughs> after, he's like full of the Holy Spirit, his wisdom, he's bold, he's got, he just knows what needs to happen. The, the before and after shots are so vastly different. And your before and after shot might look different than Peter's because he was called to be an apostle and an evangelist and birth and help birth the, the, the first church. But there are lots of people in this room who could talk about how the Holy Spirit has come on them and continues to refill them to be effective witnesses to Jesus. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> My personal story is that very soon after I came to Christ, I was at home and just really struggling with some of the decisions I needed to make to leave an ungodly relationship and to choose to put Jesus first. And I was at home on my own and I started to just speak in this brand new prayer language, baptising the Holy Spirit. And I saw how that was able to propel me to um, witness to Jesus, even when some of my friends were like, yeah, well, you're a little bit weird or you're a little bit crazy or I don't know what's happened to you, but there's something that's happened to you because you're really different than how you used to be. (laughs) But also to have the strength to follow through on some of those things that Jesus was asking me to obey him. The Holy Spirit came on me. There's a young girl in our youth who, before she was baptised in the Holy Spirit and had this new prayer language, she 
uh, was quite timid. <laughs> Afterwards, you could see the change in her confidence and now she's set up some things in her school to disciple and empower young people to know Jesus before and after. You know, there's other stories. We just had a mops meeting about two weeks ago <laughs> and we were sitting there with mothers of preschoolers. We're talking about what does the future hold and what does it look like? And as we started to pray, the sense of God's presence in that room was so tangible and we felt prompted to get on our knees and say, Holy Spirit, fill us because we want to see families, whole households come to know you and we want us to use us, Lord. We're just women who don't have a lot of time and feel like we're not got heaps to give but Lord would you use us would you empower us for your glory Barry Chant shares this illustration from empowered by the spirit he says every one of us needs heat within us to stay alive when our body temperature drops too much we are in serious danger throw us into the North Sea and as with the passengers from the ill-fated Titanic The heat will soon drain from our bodies and we will die within minutes. Not by drowning, but by freezing. In normal circumstances, heat loss is not a problem. And assuming we are in good health, we don't even think about it. In wintertime, we sustain the correct temperature by the use of warm clothing and heating appliances. (laughs) Even when the cold is not life-threatening, we normally apply heat energy upon us for greater comfort, efficiency and well-being. We are alive anyway, and hopefully we'll stay that way. (laughs) But the additional energy enables us to function more effectively. We may well and truly be alive in Christ, but our efficiency is limited. When the Spirit comes upon us, we are, to use the words of Jesus, clothed with power and able to serve God with greater effect. It is the same Holy Spirit, of course, but a different way of working. Can I encourage you, don't write off, dismiss, treat as optional or give up on asking God for this wonderful gift that he's provided for us as followers of Jesus. Because Jesus, quoting from Isaiah about a prophecy concerning him, said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. When Jesus came up out of his baptism, What looked like a dove of the Holy Spirit came and descended upon him. If Jesus needed the empowering and enabling ability of the Holy Spirit, we put aside his deity, if Jesus needed that when he walked on this earth, how much more do we? We need it. And throughout the book of Acts, there are accounts of the Holy Spirit coming upon people and groups of people who put their trust in Christ. When we're baptised in the Holy Spirit, the normal initial evidence that we've received this gift, the sign of the Holy Spirit coming on us, is that we start speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit enables us. We receive a brand new prayer language that we can use our spirits praying to God. (laughs) We don't lose control of our minds, we pray with our spirit. We have the capacity to stop or start praying in our prayer language at any time because God gives us the ability he doesn't force but he gives us the ability to pray and use this prayer language when we invite the Holy Spirit to come upon us or refill us our Christ likeness gets amplified don't you want to be more like Jesus I sure do (laughs) because the more we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives the more we become like Jesus in our thinking our saying and our doing and there's so many aspects of his character and tapping into the spiritual gifts that he supplies to meet needs that I need. It's never meant to be a one-off experience. Otherwise, we think we've arrived and stopped being reliant on God's power. We need to be filled and keep on being filled, as Paul says in Ephesians, because then we can demonstrate that it is the spirit of Jesus on us and through us and in us and who gets the glory God before his ascension Jesus forbade his disciples to start their mission without the Holy Spirit's enabling power coming on them and behold I'm sending you the promise of my father upon you but stay in the city until you're clothed with power 
And then in Acts he says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you'll be baptised in the Holy Spirit. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. To be a witness doesn't just mean sharing Jesus and planting churches, but it's, that's a huge part of why the Holy Spirit came on the early believers. It's also the power to endure and to stay true and loyal to Jesus and to witness to him under any circumstance. I just wanted to finish by saying that uh, in our gathering on Sundays, in our going from Mondays to Fridays, we need the Holy Spirit's enabling. If God's called this church that was birthed by a move of the Holy Spirit (laughs) to give witness to the risen and triumphant Christ, how much do each one of us need to be full of the Holy Spirit? We need it. There's a few pictures as well of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Baptise, whenever you read it in the New Testament, means to immerse. To immerse. When we're baptised in water, the person doing the baptising is a minister or a leader. We're immersed in water and it's for the outward sign, a public declaration of what's already taken place. When we're baptised in the Holy Spirit, the person doing the baptising is Jesus. He will baptise with Holy Spirit and with fire, John the Baptist said. And we're baptised in the Holy Spirit. We're immersed. We're overwhelmed. We're saturated in the Holy Spirit. It is God's will that every believer in Jesus be totally immersed in him, surrounded and covered and overwhelmed by his presence. As we focus on Jesus, he gives us the ability and gives us a beautiful gift. There's also a picture of falling upon. The book of Acts talks about how the Holy Spirit fell upon people as they heard the message about Jesus. Something falling implies it's got to come from the outside. (laughs) It's divine in origin. It comes from on high. And it also implies something that's sudden. It's not... A gradual infilling, it's, it's sudden. It's a gift that comes with power. The Holy Spirit is also talked about being clothed with power, implying putting on a uniform or a suit of armour. When the Spirit comes on us, we are both protected and equipped. Think about what your clothing does for you. Pour out. To pour out something, it's always necessary to be higher than the object that's below it. When Jesus pours out his spirit, he's higher and he's pouring it out on us, his people. Pour suggests abundance. It suggests a prolific flow. It's not just a little sprinkle or a trickle. It's like poured out under a waterfall. (laughs) It's refreshing. Often the concept concept in scripture of water being poured out onto dry earth is the picture that's used about the Holy Spirit, rivers of living water flowing from within. And it's also about fullness. Pours into an empty vessel to fill it. To fill something, it needs to be empty. When you pour it in, (laughs) it becomes full. But this implies openness on our part. We need to be receptive and ready to receive. I'm going to ask the team to come up.